Welcome back to Growing in the Garden State. My name is Tony and I am one of the team members that's been given the opportunity to utilize Drumthwacken, the historic New Jersey governor's mansion, as a teaching ground to help ensure that the people of our area know how to raise their own food. Now it's September, so the season is definitely coming to an end and we're thinking about our late fall crops and preparing for the spring next year. Um, but let's go to Drumthwacket and see what we've got growing on. Hello again. It is the beginning of September and we are talking garlic. So we're going to start planting a bit of garlic. Um, quite often in 6B, you would plant it a touch later, but we're going to go on and get it in. Uh, you want to plant it probably about two weeks before the first frost. So we are a bit early uh, and that's okay. It should still do fine. You don't want it to get too much top growth because you don't want a lot of top growth that's going to die back in, in a winter kill uh, with the frost. So we'll just show you how to plant a few but uh, bear that frost in mind and your, your, your current frost date when you, when you go to plant your garlic. So the first thing you're gonna do when you get your garlic, it, whether you're buying it, um, wherever you're buying it from, you, you'll get it whole like that. You don't wanna separate them until you're actually ready to plant them. So you're, all I did is I'm just taking a, a soft nail just between the cloves. You, you don't wanna cut into it. And we're just going to pull that back. We're not going to worry about the paper too much. It's, you know, it'll break down or you can pick it up and throw it away. It won't hurt anything. It's just a little unsightly. And we're just going to rub it off nice and gentle. And you want to pull the, peel the cloves, the outer layers. You don't want to pull, peel the inner layers of the clove because it may encourage rot in the ground. So what I do is when I go to break it apart, if I pull any inner um, wrapper off and expose the actual clove. I tend to plant those last as my space allows. So I'm just gently pulling that out. This is a Matucci garlic, which is one of my absolute favorites. So you can see that when I expose just a touch, so that'll go in last. We're going to come down here and these tomatoes will be gone by the time, um, we really are expecting to get a lot of top growth uh, next spring on the garlic. So we're not so concerned about planting them behind something else because right now what we want is root growth. And I plant them about four inches apart. Again, this is, I'm gonna have to get, hold on, I'm gonna have to get some, that's really hard. I'm just gonna take a little pocket knife and soften this up a bit. Down to about one to two inches, more like two because you don't want it to come up in the freeze it can actually push the garlic up and out so you do want to check as it as you start getting hard freezes you want to make sure that your garlic hasn't been pushed up out of the ground and if it has you just go back and push it right down so we're going to go about about one to two inches down and you want that top to be covered so you can see this isn't deep enough so you want basically, not quite double, but you definitely want the top of that clove covered. And you're going to put it with the flat part down into the ground, pointy bit up. Yeah. So about like that. And you're just going to go back, break it up. And you'll go back and um, water this so that it's, it's, you know, soft and pliable. But then you're going to go about every four inches. Again, you can measure it. I reckon pinky to thumb on the average person is about four, four, about four inches. If you've got long, you know, large hands, you're talking more like, more like, um, you know, five to six, but for the average person, that's about four inches. And we're just going to continue popping these in. And again, leave the skin on and don't, don't, um, peel it until you're ready to to put them in the ground. Yeah, and, and no need to make it overly complicated. Just get it in the ground, get it covered. We could have done a little more on that. I'm gonna just, there we go. No need to fret. And we'll fill this in with more Matucci. 
and we'll also put in some chestnut red, um, which do very well in Central Jersey area. This particular one, sometimes you go to, to pull your garlic and they get mixed up because sometimes if, you, if you've got several varieties, you do have to be very careful not to mix them up. And this one, we went to braiding garlic and got them mixed up. So we, we're just gonna keep it and plant it. The thing to remember is the larger the clove, the larger the bulb that you get out of it. So you wanna plant your biggest and best all the time and save the smaller ones for you know any extra space that you have big bulbs clean bulbs you want to make sure that you don't see any mold any disease any pests you know so you want to have a close look um buying garlic from organic garlic garlic from the store uh, a lot of people do it there is a risk when it comes to that in terms of pests but it's certainly a doable thing. And if you are not able to buy certified organics, seed stock garlic, organic gro grocery store garlic will often do the trick. Okay, so we've removed the large stones. We've gotten our garlic cloves in flat side, down, pointy side up. We've covered them up. They're down about an inch and a half to two inches. And we've made sure that they're well covered so that they're not being pushed back up. Um, and the next thing you need to think about is a mulch. So depending on where you are and what your gardens are, how they're laid out, you may or may not have weed issues. So for instance, our garlic is, is we're on a farm. We get weed seed blown in from the pastures. So what we do is we want to put a mulch down that's going to minimize those weeds. That can be any number of things. It can be old hay making sure that it's old enough that the weeds have you know have have sort of grown and died out or it can be straw which is a bit lighter so what you want to do is you want to we're going to put the straw down but you want to make sure that it's not so thick that the garlic can't push up through it but it's not so light that it's going to just blow away because you need that straw to stay on the bed in order to keep moisture in and to keep you know to minimize the the heave of the freeze and thaw that's going to happen over winter. So we're just gonna take, just for a little demonstration, we're just gonna take a bit, and this is, um, it's a little bit damp, which is okay. It actually will help to keep it lying down instead of blowing away. And you probably just wanna put an inch or two. Garlic is really hardy. You know, it's not like some other plants and you know, where they have softer leaves and they won't push through. You can actually layer garlic straw a couple of inches thick all over and it'll be just fine. It'll come right through that. What you don't want to do is to put, you know, four or five inches of straw down and then have it so heavily matted that the garlic can't push through. So I tend to put about, about two inches down. Um, and if you have a really dry season at the moment and very windy, you can dampen it. Um, just to kind of help it stay in place, but you don't want it soaking wet where it's going to be a problem. And again, you know, if you're using hay, you want to do, you do want to take care about where you're getting it from. You don't want to get um, hay that has chemicals in it um, that are going to kill your plants as they come up or, or retard them. Uh, same thing with the a straw you want to make sure you're getting good clean straw that doesn't have any pesticides or herbicides that are not you know that are not listed for organic growing because those things do become a factor as the straw and hay begins to break down so you want to keep your garden as organic and clean as possible so that your clean eating stays clean So it's fall, it's time to start thinking about next year. And to think about next year, I wanna start thinking about cover cropping. Now, what are the advantages of cover cropping? Um, keeping a, uh, plants growing on the soil, it holds it in place, stops it from eroding. It, it actually keeps the moisture in the top of the soil. And then next spring, I can dig that back into the soil and it's, it's a whole bunch of organic matter and fertilizer for my next year's crop. Think about your compost. Every time you throw a bucket in the compost pile, uh, if you grow a cover crop, you've got many, many, many of those buckets. So you're actually putting it back into the soil. So um, 
you don't have to wait until everything comes out of the ground to plant the cover crop. I'm going to take an, a, a, um, a sample here. These are different types of peppers, and they still probably have a month or month and a half or whatever of, of uh, picking to do. Um, but they're at the stage now where if I plant the cover crop here, they're not going to compete with each other. I could find an open space like this to put my cover crop into, except we just planted garlic there. So that's that's uh, out of the picture for right now. It doesn't hurt to, <clears throat> to go through and do a final weeding. Uh, whether you want a hand pick or you have a nice hole like this, um, it's not necessary because most of these weeds are uh, what I call uh, summer weeds and they're going to die over the winter time. In the spring, they're not going to come up right away and so that it's not going to compete with the cover crop. But if they get too big this time of year, they're going to shade the soil and they may kill some of my cover crop seed. And you know, and they also produce seed of their own for next year. So just doing a little bit of hand weed, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit of uh, weeding ar around my plants will be of benefit in the long run. So what are cover crops? You know, there's different types. Uh, generally, a lot of them are grains. Some of them are legumes, different types of legumes. And s you can often get some at your local garden supply stores, but I actually get most of mine through seed catalogs. Johnny's, High Mowing, Fedco, uh, I'm not sure about the burpees, but they all have sections in the back uh, specifically on cover cropping, I'm finding there somewhere, uh, on cover crop seeds. So um, I like to have um, supplies of different cover crops because I never know what I'm gonna plant when. Now this is the fall, so I'm gonna concentrate on some of my grains what I call the winter grains, or actually it could be annual grains, and some legumes. And I'll talk about a few of those varieties. Now, if I order them from one of these supplies, usually, sometimes you can get a half a pound or something, particularly a small seed like clovers. Sometimes they actually come in in uh, two pound, a pound or two pound bags. So you can store them in the bags if you have a dry place to store them. But I, as soon as I open them up, I like to try to store them in something that's a little more airtight, something like an old coffee can. Um, you can use a, uh, a jar if you have the jar in a place that does not get much sunlight. Because uh, I think that uh, if, if this was in the sun, it would heat the seed up, number one. And number two, I think it would uh, kind of deteriorate after a while. So different options. Um, uh, your, some of your cover crops, I, I already said, are grains. Um, this one happens to be barley. Um, I don't remember if I got this from a seed supply store, or I guess I did, it's in a bag still. Um, and it's a grain. Now one of the problems with the grains, which would include barley, wheat, rye, um, any of those can be planted. Um, and you don't have to get them from a seed supply store. You can go to a health food store where they whole, have whole grains, and you can buy some there and they should be just as good. Um, but these can have weevils in them, so you have to really, or they, they can attract weevils. So you have to keep make sure you keep them really airtight. And if I don't use all this seed up this fall, I like to put it into the freezer for a couple of days, maybe three days, and that should kill all the weevils that may have gotten in there. Once the you know the, the weather turns cold, I could, I actually put them back down in the basement in the can. They stay pretty you know they stay pretty cool. And, um, you know, they'll last for, for a couple of years. Um, some of your smaller seeds, like uh, red clover, for instance, um, are different types of clover. Um, very small seed, but it's a very hard seed, too. Pull this open so you can see a little bit. This one happens to be uh, coated in a little bit of clay. Uh, it helps with the germination a little bit. But you can see it's small seed. Now, this stuff will last for years. Uh, I probably have keep some around for about five years and I still get pretty good germination. When I know it's been, it's a little older, I'll plant a little heavier, I'll plant a little thicker because uh, I think maybe the germination rate will go down. But um, not quite so with the grains. The grains will last for, uh, will last with good germination for maybe a couple of years at the most. And so I have decided to plant uh, a combination of oats in field peas in this bed. Now the reason I'm doing that is because as you see these peppers, it's a late planted crop. So I'm assuming next year we're gonna put an early crop in here. And so oats 
and field peas on a normal year will die over winter time. So I don't have to worry about my next crop competing with the killing of the cover crop. It should die itself. Now, uh, we've had winters in the past where it hasn't all died. So, uh, you know, we, we still may have to do it, but they, if they don't die completely, they die back. So what I, the way I plant this is I just grab a handful and I just sprinkle the seed. Trying to cover it. I probably plant it a little bit thicker than maybe I have to, but nonetheless, I want to cover everything. And Okay, so field peas, it looks like a garden pea, and it probably is, has an edible pea to it, but it's bred to, uh, is a fast growing cover crop, particularly in the, uh, in the springtime, I'm sorry, in the fall. Um, again, often they'll overwinter, and these I want to plant in a sprinkle the same way, but a little thinner. One of the advantages of planting two, two crops is that if one doesn't do well for some reason, which could even be something like a flock of starlings lands here, just when they're coming out of the ground and wants to uh, fill up on our oat seeds, which has happened, um, then the field peas should do better. Um, but generally, both of them will come up. Now, uh, you say, how am I going to cover that seed? Well, I'm not, actually. Um, what I want to do is I want to create good contact with the ground. So I just take a, a regular um, garden hoe, uh, I'm sorry, garden rake, and I just tamp. And, and I'm just trying to push that stuff. So, oops, whoa. So it's in contact with the ground. It can dry out in the fall. Even in the fall, it's not as likely to dry out because of the uh, lack of, uh, uh, the not quite the intense heat of the summertime, but uh, this usually does a pretty good job. Um, it does particularly well if you get a, a uh, spell of weather in the fall that you get a little bit of rain, but it's just kind of cloudy and spits a little bit of water for a couple of days. That perfect germination weather. Uh, when you get these hot, you still get some hot sunny, sunny days like today. Um, this time of year. Uh, I can lose some from uh, poor germination. It happens some years. You never win everything. Some years you do well, some years you don't do well. But because we're, um, it's a nice hot sunny day today and we are expecting rain tomorrow night, I'm going to water this today. Uh, I don't believe in spending a lot of time caring for, for cover crops, but if I water it today, tomorrow night's rain, it should get some pretty good germination. If you just water it once, and walk away for three or four days of hot, dry weather, the seed can start to germinate and then it can die. So you've got to, you know, three or four days, you've got to make sure that the, it's uh, moist enough so that it actually germinates. And it's funny, you know, looking at the top of the soil, say, well, that's what these plants do. They drop their seeds on the top of the soil in the wild and, and they germinate. Now, if I'm a little bit more worried about dryness, I can take a mulch and I would not use, um, leaf mulch because leaf mulch will form a barrier that's hard to, uh, for the seeds to pop up through. But I can take something like straw is ideal. Hay is okay, old hay, but hay, old hay can have weed seed in it. Straw is less likely to have weed seed in it and it's a little more fluffy. So I just want to, I can cover it just a little bit. It's going to create a little bit of shade, but not so much that it's going to stop the seeds from germinating through. Probably can go on a little bit thicker than that, but I don't want to get too thick. And etc. I can cover the whole the whole bed, so that gives me a little bit of extra protection for the um, uh, for the germination. But it's actually an advantage to have the pepper seeds in here because the pepper seeds are going to shade the soil and keep it a little bit more moist, and so you actually will get better germination under the peppers. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I, I don't want to give you the impression that this is the only uh, you know pepper is the only thing you can plant cover crop season 
Um, you can see these tomatoes are looking really nice, um, but they're pretty weed free. If you can see under there, there's a few weeds in there, but not many. But I'm going to take a little bit of a chance um, and I'm going to throw some uh, cover crop seed in there too. Um, I'm going to give you a little demonstration of a little di different cover crop seed. Now I say it, take a chance. If this foliage remains this thick uh, for another month or two, the seeds might germinate and then they might die from lack of sun. But I would think that this time of year in September, these leaves are going to start browning and falling off. So I think we'll probably get enough sunlight in there. And uh, some of us, uh, for myself, I actually trim my tomatoes at the bottom. So it's, there's actually more of an open area there. But I'm going to use, um, this time, another grain, barley. Um, I said the oats will die over the wintertime. Barley will not. Barley will, will last until the, uh, until the spring. It'll start growing again. Winter rye is your most co common cover crop. You can get it at most garden supply stores, um, and which, is, which is fine. Um, and uh, this one I happen to have gotten from, I think, Johnny's Selected Seeds. Again, it's a half, a bit of a half pound bag, maybe a pound bag. Uh, yeah, there's one pound. Um, so this will probably last me for a couple of years, as long as I put it in the freezer once a year. Putting it in the freezer doesn't seem to, to um, hurt the seed at all. Um, and then, uh, okay, actually, okay, oh, here's vetch. Uh, uh, hairy vetch is a legume, like the field peas. Uh, it will actually fix nitrogen, um, and it too will last over the, over the um, uh, winter time. So it'll, it'll start growing now, and then in the winter time, It'll go dormant, pick back up in the spring, and uh, uh, do quite well. Now, one thing about vetch is uh, it uh, it has a hard shell. Let me show you those seeds again. It's got a hard shell. So if I plant it like this, I don't get as good a germination as if I what's called scarify it. Scarifying is just taking a few, putting it in a, in a tin can, and with a couple of rocks, a couple of stones, and just for a minute, just shaking it. And it scratches the surface of the, of the uh, seed, and it helps it to germinate, get a lot better germination. So as, as we did with that, uh, so basically here, uh, I'm going to end up kind of throwing this under the under the tomato plant any place I can reach in some of it's going to end up on the leaves but the next rain will probably wash it down um, and I probably won't get as good a cover but um, uh, yeah quite often I get some a really nice cover crop here by November it looks really nice um, I do the same with the oats I didn't realize that bag hadn't been opened yet so I'm not going to take the time to do that um, but uh, yeah, so you know, again, I've got a, I've got a, we'll have a nice cover crop there. Um, these will grow over the winter time, so we'll have to manage them in the spring. You know, have to till them into the soil or whatever. Um, but they should add a lot of fertility to the soil. So. One more thing about your garlic: if you're going to use uh, compost, add compost in. Uh, prior to planting your garlic, you can put it in with, you can mix it right into your garden bed soil prior to putting your garlic in, which will also help to make it a bit more friable and usable, um, and you won't need to use a, a knife to get your holes in. Um, but you can also top dress it, which means that you're just sprinkling a, a bit of aged compost on top of your beds after you've planted your garlic. The other thing that I will tell you is that if you choose to use a fertilizer, organically approved, of course. You want to use that before you put your first layer of mulch down in the late fall. You don't want your fertilizer to go on top of the mulch because it won't be as effective. So you wanna put your compost, if you're gonna to top dress, your fertilizer, a good 5.53 five, will do just fine, general purpose, and then one to two inches of whatever mulch you choose. In the spring, once your garlic has pushed through that one to two inches of mulch, you wanna go back and put another two inches of mulch on top of that to suppress springtime weeds, which we all know will drive us crazy. 
So to keep those weeds down, you go back, but you want to make sure your garlic comes through before putting on that extra layer of mulch so that you know you've got good germination and that your garlic is going to do very, very well and stay nice and moist under the mulch with uh, the summer and spring heat coming. going to today show you how you can extend your season a little bit with some simple with what I call a simple cold frame uh, this one happens to be a kit it's probably available as, as in many forms from different garden supply catalogs or garden supply stores uh, there are ways that people can build their own I've seen them done with hay bales uh, I've seen them done with uh, cement blocks uh, all kinds of things like that but basically we're just trying to extend our season so we can harvest into the into the winter time early winter time and, and actually get a, a, a jump on things in the springtime also. So what we're going to plant today is um, uh, lettuce and then this is an Asian green, Tatsoi. There's a, several different kinds and other things in the same family like arugula would, would actually work quite well also. Um, and uh, it is go it's going to be mid-September, uh, so we should be able to be harvesting this sometime in, I would say, December. Um, these have tops on them. As you see, this one happens to have a uh, be insulated. It's got a little air pocket in there, that, so it's kind of a fancy one, and, it, and it's kind of um, a little bit more advanced than some you might be able to make on your own. Um, it's It's got two doors, so you might actually have to... Uh, you know, put a little cloth in between the doors because there's places where air can get in and, and uh, they don't have to be completely airtight. Um, but the, the colder you get, the more likely it, you are going to get some damage from, uh, from the cold. So <clears throat> I'm going to plant um, a row of each of these. And um, if you're not familiar with them already, lettuce seed is, is very tiny. Um, sometimes you can get it pelleted, which is a little bit of clay on the top of it, which is a little bit easy to handle, but this it does not have it. So I am just going to make a, uh, a little bit of a, a very, very light trench. Lettuce does not like to be planted deep at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, you're more likely to lose things from rotting than you are from getting too, uh, too dry. And you can't really handle these one at a time. So I put them in one hand and then pinch, you know, maybe I've got a couple dozen seeds here and I'm just gonna basically twist my fingers. So you can probably can't see them in the film very well, but they're dropping in and they're probably dropping in a little bit too thickly. But I'd rather plant thickly and thin than uh, not have enough. So I am going to go up that whole row uh, to where I stopped, and I can finish that later. And let's see. I will do the same thing with, uh, again, it's Tatsoi, an Asian green. There's you know, a lot of different types of Asian greens. And in this particular bed, I think I'm going to make two rows. I could go maybe three, but that's getting a little bit crowded. And um, if I get too crowded, I'll have to really keep thinning out a little bit too much. This one, if I ha this way, if I have too many in the row, I can thin as they get bigger. And that'll be my first harvest. Now, <clears throat> Tatsui, uh, or the Asian greens, are a member of the Brassica family, which includes broccoli and cabbage, things we're a little more familiar with. Um, and they're very quick germinators. So... I am going to do the same thing. These are round seeds. They're a little bit easier to handle. I'm going to probably try to space them a little bit further apart because I tend to get um, a little bit better germination rate with members of the Brassica family. They germinate quickly. They come up really fast. And so I'm going to make sure that uh, I don't have too many in there. It's going to be too much work for me to thin. Okay. So I've got seed in both of those. And I'm just going to show you a little technique. Um, they don't necessarily have to be buried, but when I, when I, uh, what would I say? Rub my fingers like that. Some of them are going to fall on the bottom of the of the, um, the little trench there, and some of them are going to fall on the side. And if it's dry, 
and I cover some of the seeds in the bottom, those are the ones that are going to germinate a little bit better if it's wet. Um, then the ones on the side will be will probably germinate a little better, and the ones on the bottom might get might rot because they got too much water. So rather than pulling seed so anything like that, I just kind of chop it. And some of it is going to get buried, and some of it is not. Do the same with this one. Okay, that's as far as I've seen it so far. Now, if you have the foresight, or if you're lucky enough to find a garden supply store, uh, or a nursery that has seedlings this time of year, this is a great time to plant lettuce seedlings. Um, actually, these don't even have to go in the cold frame this time of year. I plant these outside um, just in the garden until September 15th. And, you know, they produce really good lettuce in November. So, same thing as we've done before. I'm just going to dig a little hole. Um, I don't have any compost handy right now, but if I had some, I would put a little bit in that hole and you can see the root ball there. This is really good size. Those roots are going to start spreading out. I might want to even, so it's a little hard. It's actually sand, but it's kind of a hard sand. So I'm going to chop the sides a little bit uh, just to make sure that those roots don't get confined to just the hole. But when the seedling gets to be that size, it's, it's pretty easy to take out of the container because the roots kind of hold the soil in place. When they're smaller, they tend to fall apart. Now, the growing point in the lettuce is right down in there. And I don't want to bury that. So you have to be careful not to bury them too, too small, uh, I mean too deep. Um, but yet you want to uh, cover all those roots. If you leave some of those roots exposed, then um, it, it can dry the whole plant out. Um, now, because this is covered, I have two options here. It's it's still warm, still September, so we can leave it uncovered. I know tomorrow night we're at 80% chance of rain. Uh, we should water this today once we finish. Um, or we could, uh, and we could leave the top open if we want to get some of that rain tomorrow. I don't expect real heavy rain, but this is at 80% chance. Now, in the, uh, in the fall, uh, it, it just doesn't get as dry as it does in the summertime. Uh, you get a rain in the summertime and, you know, a couple of days later, the soil can be completely dry. Um, but the fall is a little different. It just takes a lot longer to dry out. Now, if you um, are worried about, about drying, um, I could cover that with a little bit of straw, hay, uh, you know, a really light mulch like that. You don't want anything really heavy like leaves. Um, leaves compact too much and the seeds are not going to be able to make their way up. But if you do a really light covering of hay or straw, it does keep the soil a little bit wetter. And, uh, and it, 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 there's enough air in there that it allows the seedlings to still you know, uh, pop up between uh, uh, amongst the straw. All right, well that just about wraps things up. I hope you are absorbing some really great information and and I hope you're utilizing it and, and making use of all this knowledge you now have access to. Uh, if there's still some knowledge you're looking for, go check us out at nofanj.org, uh, or you can check us out on YouTube, you can connect with us on social media, all that kind of good stuff. And our team and crew want to help you grow a stronger, more awesome garden. So don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, I'm so glad you've been a part of this journey with us here at Drum Thwacket, and I look forward to seeing you next time.